title of the talk is chosen uh, as a method, particularly because uh, uh, this year the whole prize in uh, chemistry has gone to cryo electron microscopy. So, if time permits, I will probably flash a few slides just to tell about the Nobel Prize work. So, basically, this talk is uh, going to be about around the electron microscopy methods for various kinds of studies. So, let us see this. So, so as you see, that there are lots of people. So, they are all uh, kind of students here, the first one and then uh, the groups at Bremen as well as in UK. This was a very recent work where we tried to do in situ ion beam and TM at same place. When you shoot the ions on the nanostructures and observe them in the TM. So, that was some recent work. Let me see if I go there. And uh, Okay, so, the outline of talk uh, basically is what we try to do is we try to introduce the microscopy methods which many of you know it, but with a contention that um, also as uh, we wanted to spread the use of electron microscopy as well as microscopy tools in general. So, we are having forming a network of this one. So, in the process you know those who are not able to use microscopy elsewhere or want to do something which I thought. I can become like a liaison to them as a part of Microscope Society of India. So, that is one of the reason to do this. So, but you see this so there are several systems uh, you have a basically if you look at it you have an endotaxial structures we call this is a term which we use basically is a coherently embedding in, in single crystals. We also talk some uh, bimetallic structures where a small amount of silver can actually can induce a large shape transitions. These are all done in MBE conditions and we do the STM and the TM analysis. Then we show that uh, just by playing uh, tweaking the interfaces you can actually have a capping of uh, gold on zinc, zinc oxide nanowires or germanium oxide or decorate the molybdenum nano structures track MOO 3 structures and then make use of it for a lot of applications SERS, field emission, photocatalytic all these things. So, we will see how we go about it. So, the basic thing is uh, this is uh, first few slides are also meant for some students. So, the experts please uh, uh, excuse me for the being a very simpler. So, basically what we are trying to say that we want to try to understand the structure and property and uh, that is the relationship with interface as the main criteria here. And uh, what we work is basically we make interface as a parameter and try to make various types, types of nanostructures. It will become clear when you go uh, step by step. We will see that one. So, for example, look at this uh, simple structure where you have a substrate, it can be any substrate and you always have a surface. So, of course, any, sur any substrate has a surface and that means the surface is itself is a first interface with a, it is a atmospheric a surrounding atmosphere. But in this case, you know, either you can modify this interface that is the first surface or this interface and try to see what you can do. What do you mean by modification? For example, you start with a simple silicon substrate, automatically you get uh, the dangling bonds will be saturated and you get a native oxide which is 2, 3 nanometers. So, which, which actually you can modify it and you can get a surface reconstruction, reconstruction happening and then you can make use of many of those surface reconstruction. So, what we also study is you know a real time studies of this structural kinetics, how the nanostructures grow and how what happens. So, we will see that one. So, basically what we have is we have a, a thin films or nanostructures on substrates and various tools. You have a probe scene, you have electrons, photons, neutrons, ions. One of the talk will be a neutron diffraction uh, DOS will be giving and then you can detect many of these things. If you shoot electrons in and electrons out, it is electron microscopy. It can also be with electrons in, you can do many things. So, basically all the scattering phenomena what we do in probing, you have a probes in and probes out as a detection. So, basically you can use a various kinds of scattering mechanisms and try to understand the, blo the, uh, 
the, the inter surfaces and interfaces. So basically, I'll, I will be, in my talk, there will be X-ray diffraction in mostly electron microscopy and some RBS, where all these methods will be used. So basically, if you look at it, you know, uh, seeing is believing. Actually, if you look at uh, the Nobel Prize 2017 in chemistry is given, you know, for capturing the life in atomic details. That's the title what they have given. So basically, in the end, can we image of anything in atomic detail? So the, the problems what the Nobel laureates got through over cry, using a cryogenic cryo microscopy is something very interesting. So basically, in the end, we try to look at the imaging processes, how this uh, electron microscopy can be used. So um, of course, this you don't need it. So but what only I want to say that because of the electron wavelength is so small that uh, Rayleigh criteria need not bother about it and you can get beautiful atomic result. What you see here is a column of atomic rows which for a single crystal silicon substrate. This doesn't have any aberration correction. Of course, with aberration correction and you can actually go to femtometers uh, or picometers in principle information uh, limit. So it's actually the electron microscopy has really progressed quite a lot with aberration characters. So we can uh, see that one. So what now I go on is I take some of the students in uh, confidence and say that you know what are the techniques we use and what are the exa some examples I'll be giving with the uh, recent results as well. So the first one is uh, scanning electron microscopy is here as you know basically you have a electron beam. Now there are recent developments or there are characters in the scanning electron microscopy as well to get a better resolution. Also something called environmental microscopy where your sample need not be conducting in nature. You can just take a leaf, take a water, take a cell, put it in the microscope and do the microscopy because that's where the developments have come and we can, we have a, uh, it's called a environmental microscopy. So basically here you have a beam in and of course there's no transmission otherwise the TM will come. So then you have a, uh, this one. So this is a microscope what we have is a JICE microscope. We also have, so we have a field emission gun based ACM as well as a ESM facility which are available to many of you people as well. So if, uh, anybody is interested, they can always contact us. And we here, we also have something interesting. We have a two manipulators where we'd like to do a transport properties inside the system. Two manipulators uh, for that one. Okay, so this uh, probably is uh, very well known, uh, the electron microscope picture of this. So what I do right now is, I take a scanning electron microscopy and go through some of the recent results what we have got, where we used it the microscopy as a tool to understand. Of course, this is relatively little older, but it's a fun experiment where we had a sil just a sim simple silicon substrate with a native oxide, and then we deposited a gold layer of various thicknesses. What we did is uh, that we just uh, did a kind of a uh, annealing experiment. You take the sample, uh, just vary the gold layer, but make sure that you anneal it in atmospheric conditions. What happens in atmospheric conditions is that the silicon dioxide layer grows, the, the layer thickness grows, so that the gold layer doesn't interdiffuse into the silicon. Actually, if the gold goes into the silicon substrate, the gold silicide forms, lots of things happen. So, but to this simple with this one, you can actually grow very, very highly oriented gold, single, gold crystals can be grown. It's a very simple technique, just anneal it in atmospheric conditions. But by varying the thickness of this gold layer, we can have a various shapes of it. But what is a, you can also use these things for various structures, like this can be as a catalyst. That's what I will try to see this one. For example, in this case, we use this as a catalyst and try to grow a zinc oxide. Um, see, the, the issue here is the beauty of the uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy. You can use a low energy electron microscopy uh, to look at the real surface events like 1 keV, 2 keV, or you can use a high energy 20 keV, and then you can really get the information what you can get this. And in this case, for example, we have a basically simple zinc oxide growth using a CVD method. 
you have a furnace, quartz furnace, and you have uh, a graphic, um, the source the MO zinc oxide powder as along with uh, mixed with graphene mixture, graphite mixture. And then when you heat it, you know, this side or this side of the tube and this side of the tube, you get a different structures. What is, what is important here is that, again, I'm trying to tell you based on the microscopy tools, because I'm trying to bring, uh, rather to try to sell that microscopy is a good tool, which all of you know, but um, uh, give some examples of this one. So in this case, for example, this is a nano wires where you beautifully, you see this, uh, you see this well-oriented crystals of gold there. Actually, the problem, the interesting thing happens when you have such kind of gold facetted crystals on nanowires, the properties, catalytic properties, photo emission, uh, field emission properties, they vary it quite a lot. So we see a lot of um, applications of this one, which I will not be going through this talk. I'll be just going through microscopy aspects of it. But interesting thing is by just changing the few parameters on the surface, for example, if you use a smaller gold crystal instead of a larger crystals, you can actually tune the size of the particles. So all we are doing is just playing with the uh, surface and interfaces and able to get different, different structures. And the um, SEM can give you beautiful information on this one. Similarly, in this case, we have a silver film and a uh, substrate. It can be even any substrate. But the interesting thing here is, you see that this is a molybdenum trioxide wires, nano wires, or nano, it can be nano plates also, this one. What is important is the silver decorates. The, the more important news is this, interesting news is this, the silver gets deposited only on particular surfaces, on zero surface. So we have done a DFT calculations to show that the energetically favorable surface. So, I mean, all this information, like, what, what is the, imp the, there are a lot of uses because this is a plasmonic particles, you can use it in many applications. You are actually having a value addition to these nanostructures. So, the, so because, uh, again, uh, a simple SEM pictures can give you a lot of information, where they go, how they are oriented to the structures. And this, this is a system which I think probably uh, somebody, some of you are talking about it. Uh, we have a molecular beam vessel, uh, epitaxial facility here. It's basically a UHV chamber where you have a three Knudsen cells, which was developed uh, way back in 2003 by Bupendev at uh, IOP while he was there which we are using right now. So basically these three Nielsen cells and UHV chamber, we also have a VTSTM attached to it. So using this, again here what I'm trying to do is, here we are trying to use a clean surface and do a reconstruct, use, make use of a reconstructed silicon surfaces for having a, a lot of interesting structures. So in this case, for example, what we did is we took a, a silicon 110 surface, and when you deposit gold, because of this anisotropic diffusion, actually you see that there is a, a gold wire formation. But if you, if you deposit a small amount of silver on a clean, clean silicon surface, and the aspect ratio can be very large. So what is that it makes to make a high aspect ratio silver wires is one thing which uh, is a PhD thesis of one of this person, Anjan Gupta. So for example, similarly, uh, this is uh, seven by seven reconstruction, but if you look at a high index planes, like a, where you have a vicinal surfaces, like five by 12, after reconstruction, you get uh, one dimensional periodic lattice spacing. Now what we do is we use this as a template for a growth of a bimetallic structures. So in that process, what happens is, if you deposit a gold on a 5 by 12 surface, this is without silver, and when you deposit a one, like 0.25 monolayers of silver, small amount of silver, then you see that aspect ratio is changed. And then actually what we have done is, we try to simulate with can, uh, KMC, Kantic model, sim, Kantic Monte Carlo simulations, assuming the properties of anisotropic diffusion of silver and gold, and putting a parameters of that, we could show that by adding a silver, a small amount of silver is indeed changes the, uh, the aspect ratio of that one. Okay, so for all this, that the previous studies were basically used uh, electron, the scanning electron microscopy. 
Now I go with the electron magnet, the TM. This again, the TM is about uh, 50, 20 years old. We have a thermionic field emission gun here, and then we have a 200 kV acceleration. Of course, uh, we have a, now a good uh, digital camera. So with this one, so what we are trying to do is we have a 200 kV goes in, and then you can use a, either elastically scattered electrons, which is a diffraction, or the imaging. You can also do imaging with this annual dark field imaging called STEM using this. The various processes can be used in electron microscopy to understand this. Actually, the, so um, you will be surprised, I think I'll come to see this one. The first, Asia, first microscope in Asia was built in Calcutta in a transmission electron microscopy in which uh, Professor Das Gupta was the person who did it. I'll probably come back, come to the, towards the end, I'll come to that one uh, where he did some of these measurements. And uh, uh, let me see how we go there. So basically, electron microscope uh, is not new for this community in Calcutta particularly because this. The, so what you see here is you can make use of various uh, uh, processes involved in this electron TEM purpose and get a lot of benefits, a lot of high resolution systems. So uh, using this one, uh, this is a uh, still trying to understand. The, basically, if you look at this one, this is a silver grown on a 557 substrate, and you have a periodic dislocations present here. We are trying to understand how this can be formed, a periodic dislocations on the surface. So, but you can beautifully image it. That's the important thing. We can image them. You can see them atomistically that there is a, you see this, uh, what you see here, a small uh, kind of a modulation is because at each point you have a, a, a dislocation present. So basically, uh, this is again not in a high-end electron microscope. It is a simple high-resolution TM, amazing. Okay, but uh, for the audience, you know, some very beginner in the students, actually, the electron microscope TM is nothing is similar to an optical microscope. You have a source, you have a um, uh, image, rather so. Uh, for, uh, you have a condenser lens system here. And then you have a sample and then imaging system. So with that one, you can accept that you have a uh, electromagnetic lenses here. And uh, for example, if you see this, your specimen is here. And then either the interesting part here is, again, you have a diffraction pattern or the imaging. So both just by changing this signature, whether you make a image, for example, if you magnify the diffraction pattern, you get a sad, sad or selected area diffraction, or, or you can, if you magnify this part of it, you get image. So basically, the electron microscope is so simple, either which part of it are you going to magnify it, whether it's a focal plane or the image plane. When you magnify the focal plane, you get the diffraction pattern. When you magnify the image plane, you get the imaging. And that is done just with a click of a button. So you can get a real space and uh, Fourier space at the same place. So this is another simple thing which uh, students can get benefit. Just you have a direct beam here, and you have planes. And this, what you see is the diffraction pattern. The distance, just by knowing the distance between these two spots, and knowing this camera length, which can be calibrated value, and then one can determine what is the d spacing. The interesting thing here is in electron microscopy, in electron microscopy, you get a several spots. Like unlike L L X ray diffraction, you need a you need to go through all the angles, whereas in an electron diffraction, in one shot you can get a lot of them. There are many reasons for that. One number one is your wavelength is very small, so your bag angle is very small. Other is the electron has about ten thousand times more scattering. X rays usually uh, interact only with the electrons, whereas electrons can interact with the nucleus as well as electrons. So about 10,000 times more scattering cross-section. So it's very simply, it gives you all the information in a single shot. But electron microscope itself is a lab in itself. You can have many in-situ experiments. One can have a just simple uh, heater and try to see, look at the kinetics, what will happen to the kinetics of it. For example, for example, you have a system here. 
this system is a simple ex uh, example where we have a silicon 110 substrate here, a gold. Uh, this is deposited in H. Whenever you, ha you don't have an oxide layer interface here, which means that I have deposited in the uh, UHV conditions, whereas this is just a oxide layer is there. Now, what happens is if you anneal the systems, in this case, uh, when the silicon dioxide uh, this gets etched out, you form a beautiful uh, rods. So, now the issue here is actually you can uh, uh, actually do the mapping. So, what we have done is we ran through a 10 minute. Uh, so, we have taken the sample, put it in the TM, and look at how as a function of time you image it and also do the diffraction uh, as well and try to conclude how this nucleation is doing. The nucleation kinetics can be obtained by doing a, a in situ TM. So, what we have is about uh, 30 millisecond time resolution here and uh, we can raise up to 1000 uh, degrees Celsius. So, one can get all this kind of information by a simple doing a simple experiment, you can understand the kinetics of it. But of course, these days, um, you have a much, much bigger microscopes, a lot of more money as well. And this is an aberration, double aberration character, very complicated, okay. But uh, a person, Knut Wubban, I think he just missed the Nobel Prize because the uh, Nobel Prize was given to somebody else now, not for the technique development, but the use of it. Otherwise, he's the one person who developed this uh, aberration character microscope. And they could see way back in 2018, the silicon dumbbells as well in 112 direction. So, the, by using aberration correction, one can do all this uh, single molecule or single, po single molecule spectroscopy as well can be done. Okay, so, what we try to see is, for example, this is one other study where right now I am working on what the use of electron microscopy. So, various uh, uh, examples I will be giving. One such example is a very a simple and novel method, again making use of uh, interface here. For example, in this case, okay, this, this example shows a very first results of uh, Bupen's group on growing a germanium on epitaxially on it. This one is, uh, this is done in MBE, molecular MBE condi UHV conditions. This endotaxy, that means the silver embedding in silicon is done in just a air atmospheric conditions. But by playing certain things, for example, in this case, we have a, you, ma, you modify the interface with the germanium oxide and take this reaction between silicon dioxide and germanium oxide and then form this kind of structures. Not only that, you can do a tomography of it and get a three dimensional structure of that oriented. How, for example, this is on one, one zero zero surface. Actually, you see that there is a four fold symmetry there. And when it goes inside, it is a 111 planes. That is very energetically favorable. So, we actually done the Wolf reconstruction and get got the values why this has a particular shape. So, we can actually, the electron microscope can give you really beautiful details how the structure is formed. Okay. So, uh, not only that, you know, if you have a 100, this is a planar samples. That means from the planar, what we saw this one is a cross sectional. But you can also look at the planar. And then we see that if it is a 100 surface, a four fold symmetry, and then 110, then 11. So, you can actually, by just by tweaking a substrate orientation, we can change this one, right. Well, these are the details of the experiments how we have done. So, I will just go ahead. Not only that, you can also do a, do a very good composition analysis. For example, in this case, when we have this system, when we have this system here, what does it consist of? The elemental composition of the substrate, this layer, even the top layers, just simply shoot the electrons and look at the X-rays detected. It's called a EDS, right? Energy dispersive spectrospectry. You look at the secondary electrons, and then you can get a uh, lot of information about that. But how the distribution of each element is present, like in this case is oxygen, in this case is a germanium K signal and the silver. And uh, this is this, this is just is called a STF, is an annular dark field imaging. Basically, uh, it is done in a high angle, so that goes as Rutherford scattering. That's why the scattering cross section for the silver is large. Whereas this is a EDS uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy. 
Now what happens is the electron microscopy, one of the drawback so called is, is the micro or nanoscale dimensions. What you see is only nanoscale dimension at a given time. But if you want to take at a macroscopic arrangement, then the X-ray diffraction is the best. So what we do is we can uh, do a diffraction and show that this actually all the silver nanostructures what you see, they're all aligned. Not only that, we can do a simple experiment, real time experiment. This experiment is basically what we have is a hot stage and a goniometer. And then this, we just put a two silver wires and a hot plate, right? And then basically here, we have a substrate here and two silver wires and they heat the substrate. And then as a function of time, look at how the silver structures goes, the real time X-ray diffraction. Okay, so this is what we see, and uh, we, uh, we see that as a function of time and the temperature actually, the reaction, this is all happening, the reaction between the silicon dioxide and the surface and interface reactions happening, and you see the silver signal growing up. And actually you can also see that you can calculate what is the um, thermal expansion coefficient of the silver nanostructures because the, as a function of the time, this is what we have done it, right? Okay, so this is where what, this is kind of structures. When we see that the silver nanostructure growth, this is what is happening. When it all happens, the silver is embedded inside the silicon. So we try to do the TM, HCM, TEM, X-ray diffraction and try to combine the results and try to understand. That's where actually you need to have a correlation. Otherwise, just looking at one, you can just uh, imagine how an elephant can be looked in different directions. If you don't know that elephant is that, then you can interpret whatever the inferences you can get. So there is, this is another one which is a very uh, recent one uh, where the, uh, we are in interesting top work basically to look at uh, these are the nuclear structure materials which uh, uh, BRC grows, but uh, I'm not going to much details. But what is important is, uh, I think uh, Das is here, so he knows that one probably. So what you have is you have a precipitates. Uh, what you want to find out is as a function of time, how this, whether the precipitate dissolve or not. In this experiment, we had a, uh, a 200 kV, 250 kV neon beam falling. At the same time, we look at as a function of time and a dose, try to see when they get dissolved. For example, in this case, they completely dissolve what is called a 44 dPa displacement per atom. Whereas, if you have a, this kind of composition, the niobium, zirconium, niobium, even at 325 D, dPa, nothing happens. Which based says that this kind of material is better for a, a nucleation, nuclear structure material than the previous one. But again, the TM is coming into the picture here, trying to help you to study the real time studies and simulating the uh, uh, actually the radiation effects here. Okay, so summary, the chairman has already got up, so I just like to come to summary, uh, but I'll go a couple of minutes, I use it for, uh, he said four minutes, I have another two, three minutes, I'll talk to Cryo TM where that is. But you can stop me whenever you like, of course. Whenever you get up, I'll stop. Electron microscopy, basically various methods, SCM, TM, STEM, HRTM, Aberration character TM, they play very useful, uh, very important and useful role to establish structural determination and hence properties of materials can be tailored. But you need a complementary tools to understand. And our future project is to get a time resolved TM. Means right now we are using a, a thermionic emission or field emission guns, but now we are going for a photo emission based gun to uh, do a time resolved TM. That's the future plan which we are planning to go. So the reason why I said is this one, we want to make a forum in India. Uh, so as a president of Microscope Society, I wanted to make sure that there is a network which can be useful to make use of all the facilities in India. That's the reason why I choose this topic and invite uh, anybody who wants to get some help, we are there to do that. Okay, uh, last two minutes. Uh, it's an interesting work and uh, actually um, it can be this each one of them, the Nobel laureates, uh, Dubashed, Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson, they spent almost 40 years, four decades of the work, relentless work, just imaging a biomolecule 
And you see this, this is before 2013, it's called a blobology, where they used to see as only blobs, but now they can have an atomic resolution of even two angstrom. This is a cryo-electron microscopy. So if you look at what really happened, I will, I will actually, we'll, we'll go here. Uh, this is a, from the web page of Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics web page has this, uh, where Professor N. N. Dasgupta is a founder of Electron Microscope Society, he is the person who did it. Right now we are inheriting it. But if you see that uh, 1948 is the one which has made, and you look at it, he has studied the electron microscopy of called parasite, malaria parasite E. coli in 1940s, around 1950s, there are a couple of nature papers. There is a, I, I don't know where we lost, but all the time we lose. So, but there is seriously, and you see now the Nobel Prize is given, except that it is for the atomic resolution spectra of biomolecules, which 1948, which they could do in a simple electron microscopy like this. So, basically, it's of course, there are, a, uh, it's not just there are a fiction stories also. I don't know how many people have read it. I have not read it yet. Uh, I read only the abstracts of this book. This is uh, Tompkins inside himself, Adventures in New Biology. I uh, try to get that book if, if possible. But it's an interesting one, it seems. But when things were not available as uh, fiction it is, but it is written by Gamow. So, uh, so it's, uh, they could go through and find out each organ, how it looks like in atomic details. That's what actually right now is the thing. If you know in atomic details of all these biomolecules, you can actually devise a drug. I think the um, Professor Bose also was, today morning she was giving you, giving us a lot of uh, interesting results. And you see these are the, I don't understand much of these things, but I see that as a microscopist, it gives you a lot of information. For example, a atomic resolution of a three-dimensional images of virus at atomic resolutions. You see, the, actually the, what is interesting is this guy, please stop me whenever, uh, uh, okay, that's a, so because this, 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 is a, this is a Richardson's work. He is an extra crystallographer. I mean, he, he was an extra crystallographer. And extra crystallography, people needs lot of large single crystals. Of course, neutron also needs large single crystals. So, but you could not get the resolution. I mean, he had a problem, you know. Uh, you could not make some of the biomolecules a single, you could not crystallize the samples. So he happened to meet a neighbor who is an electron microscopist. And they started working on this one. And uh, you knew the symmetry. Using the symmetry, they could get this one. But over the time, Richardson, with the development of the new, uh, new electron microscopies, they could actually get atomic resolution of the same molecule. Okay? So the, the other thing is the, the sample. One, one has gone to sample preparation. Another, this is the Dubosha, where he vitrified the sample. Other one is a simple 2D to 3D lattice imaging. Uh, so the three people contributed and uh, really wonderful work. This is awesome. So I thank you.